Hello and welcome to another one of our TLDR Explained videos. In this one we're going to be taking a look at the Australian style points based immigration system, which seems to be all the rage here in the UK at the moment. Originally, the Australian style points based immigration system was a UK policy way back in 2015 when Nigel Farage was leader. But like Brexit, what started off as a fringe Farage policy has now become mainstream. In fact, Preeti Patel recently commissioned a review by the Migration Advisory Committee on the system's merits. And during the leadership contest, Boris Johnson himself actually pledged to introduce it. More recently, Johnson posted about it on his official Facebook page. So it's clearly popular with the government and the Conservatives are loving it. But what actually is an Australian points-based immigration system? Before we get to that, let me just shout out our pin badges. I'm sure you've heard us mention our high quality, beautiful enamel pin badges before, but I just wanted to let you know that we've restocked basically all of our badges and we've released some charity badges. The profit of these season three badges will go to charities helping people in those countries. Find the badges and even get yourself a free TLDR Christmas card by heading over to the store. There's a link to that down below. So, back to the Australian immigration system, which everyone in the Conservative Party seems so keen on. Immigration systems can basically be separated into three categories. Unrestricted, like the freedom of movement in the EU. Economically restricted, like Australia, the US, and basically every other developed country in the world. And totally restricted, like say North Korea, Eritrea, and maybe to a lesser degree, places like Japan. When the UK leaves the EU and ditches freedom of movement, it looks like it will only have freedom of movement with Ireland. So, by definition, it will have some limits on EU immigration, as the UK currently does with non-EU migrants. So, it's worth starting by looking at the UK's current laws for non-EU immigration. Well, non-EU migrants have to apply for one of five visas. Tier 1 visas are quote-unquote high-value migrants, like entrepreneurs, investors, and well-regarded professionals. Tier 2 visas are more common, and they apply to skilled workers who have been offered a job in the UK. Tier 2 visas cost between £500 and £1,200, depending on the length of occupation, and there's a cap of 2,700 visas per year. However, there are exceptions for ministers of religion, sports and creative workers, as well as intra-company transfer. In 2018, doctors and nurses, who used to account for about 40% of all general Tier 2 visas, were also excluded from the cap, in order to allow the NHS to recruit as many new staff as it needs. Also, as of 2017, the jobs that the migrants are coming to do need to be paid at least £30,000 per year for them to qualify for a Tier 2 visa. Tier 3 visas were originally intended for low-skilled migrants, but they were discontinued, so they're not really a thing anymore. Tier 4 visas are what's known as general student visas, and they are, somewhat unsurprisingly, for students studying in the UK. They cost £348 each, and are by far and away the most popular visa, with some 200,000 students coming to the UK in 2017. Tier 5 visas are for temporary workers, and they cost £244 each. They allow you to stay for either one or two years, depending on your job. So, those are the different types of visas available to migrants wishing to immigrate to the UK. Interestingly, if you apply for a Tier 2 visa, you'll be asked some questions about how much your job pays, your qualification, how much you've saved, who your employer will be, and how good your English is. And lo and behold, you'll be awarded points based on your answers. A similar thing also happens for Tier 5 visas, and it's because of this that the UK actually already has a points-based immigration system. It was brought in in 2008 under Gordon Brown, and has been consistently amended since. In fact, until 2016, there used to be a calculator on the Home Office website where you could find out how many points you'd be worth if you applied for a visa. So what's Johnson talking about when he advocates for an Australian-style points-based system? Is he just talking about applying the current system for non-EU migrants to EU migrants, or is he talking about something more substantial? Well, the big difference between the Australian system and the UK system is that the Australian points-based system doesn't require you to have a job. If you can rack up enough points, you can get an Australian work visa without getting a job to go straight into. The Australian system, by the way, should actually be called the Canadian system. Canada was the first country to implement a points-based system, way back in 1967, and Australia only got on the bandwagon in 1979. In fact, 
Way back in 1896, Clifford Sifton, the Canadian Interior Minister, aggressively recruited migrants from Eastern Europe to help the spluttering Canadian economy with one of the first modern, economically selective migration policies. Anyway, so what exactly happens in the much-discussed Australian system? Well, to qualify as a skilled, independent migrant, you need 65 points. And here's how you get them. If you're aged between 25 and 32, you score 30 points. If you have a superior level of English, you can score up to 20 points. If you've got 8 or more years of skilled work experience, you can score 20 points if that experience was in Australia, and 15 points if it was overseas. You can also score for formal education qualifications, with up to 20 points for a PhD, with more to gain if the person studied in Australia. The visa itself costs about £2,000, and lasts for five years, with an option to renew after year two. Anyway, the main difference between the Australian and Canadian systems and the UK's existing system is that the Australian and Canadian systems don't require potential skilled migrants to have a job offer, but the UK does. However, recently both Canada and Australia have moved towards an employer-led migration system, after businesses complained that the government wasn't letting in the right sorts of employees. In 2013, about 14% of skilled migrants that came into Australia without an immediate job offer were unemployed, compared to 1% of migrants who arrived with a job waiting. In Canada, too many applicants met the required points threshold, and businesses complained that their potential employees were being held back in a waiting line of mostly mediocre applicants. This is why in 2015, Australian visas granted on the basis of job offers rose fivefold compared with the decade before, and Canada reworked its own system so that any skilled applicant with a job offer scores higher than any applicant without. Essentially, both countries began weighting their application process towards a more employer-led model, like the UK. In fact, a similar thing did happen in the UK when the system was first introduced in 2008. Businesses complained that they couldn't get the employees they needed, and special exemptions were created for a whole load of sectors, with special treatment for butchers and ballet dancers, and no requirement for footballers to speak English. In fact, the main way that the current Australian system differs from the UK is in its scope. Australia has a net migration of about 2,400 people a year, which is about the same as the UK in 2016, which welcomed about 244,000 new migrants. However, Australia has a population of about 25 million, whereas the UK has a population of about 68 million which means that per capita, Australia takes in about 2.5 times more migrants than the UK. This means that the UK would have to have a net migration of 600,000 people to be equivalent with Australia. In fact, Australia's refugee resettlement plan is 10 times as big as the UK's per capita, and the opposition Labour government want to increase it by 70%. Australia doesn't let in more migrants just because it's got more space. In fact, 90% of their migrants end up in one of two cities. Sydney and Melbourne. This is why 30% of Australia's population was born overseas, compared to just 14% of the UK's. Australia's main program for newly arrived immigrants, the Adult Migrant English Program, now has a budget of about 50% higher than the UK government's entire spending for English classes for speakers of other languages, in a country some 60% smaller in population. New migrants to Australia are entitled not just as a matter of policy, but as legislation, to 510 hours of English tuition, and around 60,000 people are served by AMEP each year. That Australia receives so many more migrants than the UK might come as a bit of a shock, considering that the Conservatives keep saying that they want to use an Australian system in order to reduce the level of migrants entering the UK. This might be why Theresa May, who wanted to cut immigration down to the quote-unquote tens of thousands, hated this idea so much when she was Home Secretary. So, why do Conservatives love the Australian system so much, when it's becoming more employer-led like the UK system, and lets in more migrants than the UK's current system does? Honestly, we don't know. Maybe it just sounds good. As I mentioned right at the beginning, we now have six new badges in the store and the profits from those badges all go to charities in the countries. Also, as I hinted, you can get yourself a TLDR Christmas card signed by the whole TLDR podcast team. We've created this TLDR Christmas card featuring the outgoing speaker trying to pick up a bit of work as a delivery driver. We won't be selling these as selling Christmas cards feels a bit weird, but we've signed 200 of them and we're ready to send them out. 
So we've decided that anyone who spends more than £40 in the pin badge store before Christmas will also be sent one of the signed cards. We're hoping that doing so might encourage more people to pick up the charity badges. And if not, at least we had a nice time signing them. If you enjoyed this video and want more content from us, then be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube. You can also hit the bell icon if you want to be notified every time we release a video. And if you want more from us, you can find TLDR across all social networks simply by searching for TLDR News. And if you want your name featured at the end of the videos, just like these people, then you can sign up to back us on Patreon. There's a link to that in the description.